So, um, we have a world state uh, of some kind. You get a stimulus, um, and then you get a perception in the brain. The, the actual location of where the perception in the brain is uh, doesn't have anything to do where it's actually in the brain. It's just to show that it's things happening in the brain. Uh, so in the no, non-simulating brain, you get uh, some kind of perception uh, that's associated uh, or sends uh, on uh, activation to a motor area. Um, for example, via some simple, and you've learned this via some simple conditioning mechanism or, or whatever. Uh, and that gen makes you react in a certain way. Your reaction uh, enables you to, or, or you get in a different context, you get in a different bodily context and a different environmental context. So then you have a new world state, which again generates a perception and so on. So this is the non-simulating brain. If we look at what happens in an, what I call an online simulation, uh, simulating brain, then you, this happens first, but something special happens when uh, the motor structures are starting to get uh, activated. So the motor planning areas and the prepar preparatory act uh, action areas, when they start to get activated, what happens is that they send a signal to the uh, sensory areas of the brain. Uh, so they uh, uh, predict, uh, so they generate a perception that predicts the possible consequences of actually executing this action uh, in the real world. So instead of, uh, so it, it's a kind of perce a perceptual uh, prediction, so to say. And that arrives then before the actual uh, stimulus arrives. So this, uh, well, since I said it was a prediction, it has to arrive before the actual stimulus. Uh, and then, uh, at some later point, you get uh, the world state, and that also uh, helps update the perceptual state of the brain or of that brain area. But so the interesting thing is what happens here is that uh, well, this is the uh, simulation aspect that you get the prediction uh, of what is likely to happen, and this is actually. Uh, or this has been used by Sarah Jane Blakemore to explain why we can't tickle ourselves. Because since we can predict what it will feel like to do this or this, uh, our doing this will not actually be something special for the brain. Because it already knows that it will feel like this. Uh, so it will not tag this as something special, that's something that you need to worry about. Uh, but it's harder, much harder to predict what it will feel like when somebody else tickles you, or you might not even see it. Uh, so that does, so it generates a bit of a surprise. You know that something is going to happen, but you don't know exactly. So then this uncertainty uh, makes our brain react. It wants to remove itself from the stimulus in certain ways. Um, so that's um, um, yeah. So that's why we. Uh, get ticklish. Uh, you can, for example, try and tickle yourself with a feather because that's also pretty hard to predict what that will feel like exactly. Uh, so that's what happened in, in the online case and then it goes on, of course, uh, as usual, and you have these predictions happening all the time. Uh, in the offline simulation brain, something else happens. Then we remove all the inputs and outputs, basically, and let the brain generate uh, every prediction for itself for a longer time period. So now we can simulate uh, different uh, interactions with the world without the, uh, any input from the world guiding what we actually uh, imagine or what we uh, try to simulate, so to speak. Uh, so this is of course a bit harder for the brain to do in a way because you don't get these uh, stimulus updates that can correct uh, the actual uh, uh, simulated state uh, and, and drive it in the right direction. So here the uh, brain has to guide itself in the right direction. And when it comes to robot models, it seems like the, it's quite hard when you do it like this. Uh, it gets harder than when you have the uh, instant update of your uh, current state. Uh, 
but before getting to the robot dreams and robots, I'd like to uh, give uh, an example of one study that illustrates this aspect of the online simulating brain. And um, I also chose it because it's, uh, I thought it was a nice example of uh, why you, uh, or, or why you sometimes need to use deception. And that um, uh, they use it in a, in a pretty good way, uh, which strengthens the conclusion that you can make from this experiment. Uh, so what they made was make people wear blindfolds and do uh, this. Um, the main purpose of the uh, uh, study was to investigate here, what I say, are the visual effects or anticipations, I, as I call them, of action limited to modulations or extend to stronger generative effects. So for example, in the ticklish uh, case, uh, you could explain that by it's only modulations of the uh, perceptual state that you already had that causes the, uh, the effect. Or is it something more that it can actually generate the actual visual uh, feeling or the actual feeling of the ticklishness uh, of uh, something or this uh, feeling of the touch of the skin? Uh, that's what they mean by the generative effects. Can it actually... Uh, cause uh, a conscious sensation of this. Uh, so, what they did was that they um, collected lots of participants, told them that they were in, in investigating the uh, detection of motion under low lighting conditions. So this was the first kind of de deception. They were, didn't tell them the purpose of the study, as you usually don't. Uh, but then they also had uh, two blindfolds, one which they said had, well, one had holes in it, so that led through uh, a bit of light, but not much. Uh, and then they said they, they had this other super blindfold without holes that uh, led through no light. Uh, but that was a deception as well, uh, because both um, uh, uh, blindfolds didn't uh, let through any light, so they, they were totally darkened. Uh, but the participants thought that one of them actually let through light. And what they did was uh, uh, they told the, st uh, the participants that they were going to test them twice. So one uh, with each uh, blindfold, uh, the one that let through light and the other one that didn't. And then they randomized which one they started with. So the uh, key idea they had there was that if you uh, use, uh, well, in the first trial, if you don't get a visual experience then, then you're more likely to believe that you had the, uh, uh, the one that doesn't let through uh, light. So then you're more likely to believe that uh, the next one will let through light. So you will be more likely to say that you had a visual experience. But if you have experienced uh, a visual sensation in the first trial, then you're likely to believe that this was the one with the holes in it and that in the next trial you would not get any uh, visual sensations at all. So you had these expectations uh, which could help understand the uh, results. And the results showed that uh, roughly 50% of the uh, participants in, in the first trial said that they had some kind of visual sensation. And uh, on the trials where um, you got a visual sensation on the first, uh, uh, or uh, the participants that got, said that they had a visual sensation on the first trial, it turned out that 40 of them actually also had a visual um, a sensation of motion, even though they were very likely to believe that they, in the second trial, had the uh, totally darkening uh, blindfold. So uh, the uh, researchers here, and I think it's a valid point, said that this shows that uh, it is actually uh, a real visual sensation that they have because they have the expectation or that the next time you, you shouldn't really see something. Uh, and then they are less likely to report just that, oh, yeah, uh, to please the experiment or whatever reason they have. Uh, they would have been less likely, but instead they actually report a visual sensation, which tells you that it might be a real thing. So I think it's a, a pretty neat experiment, and, and it also shows here that uh, 
uh, the brain has this ability of generating the visual uh, uh, sensation and reactivating the visual areas. So if we use the same um, uh, uh, scheme that I showed you before, uh, it will look like this. Uh, the uh, experiment that tells you to move your hand, uh, uh, you have an auditory perception of that, which leads you to actually start moving your hand and action. And this will, as before, lead you to uh, lead the brain to predict the next state of your hand, the next bodily perception of where, so the, the, uh, what the proprioceptive effects would be and the kinesthetic effects would be and how they are represented in the brain. So that's predicted immediately when you start moving your hand. And what the researchers also say is that this, what the experiment shows is that this has also been the, so the, uh, uh, the, the state of the body has been associated so many times with the visual impression of the hand being in this position that the brain itself can generate that perception. Um, I would say also that it's possible that the action uh, also directly perhaps can to some extent uh, uh, give that prediction or help give that prediction. But the researcher uh, favored this particular interpretation that the association is between the uh, bodily perception and the visual perceptual areas and that the brain generates that association. So that's what happens in the online simulation. So that's another uh, or, uh, uh, example of the online simulation brain. Oh, uh, I should speed up a bit, I think. Um, OK, so now we've talked a bit about the anticipatory uh, aspects of simulation. So let's just briefly revisit the uh, reactivation aspect. Uh, and as you know, in cognitive science, there is always some old philosopher or uh, some Greek who has already come up with your ideas. So here he is, Alexander Bain. Uh, he's one of the uh, people who started talking about reactivations. Uh, so this is a common idea in the associationist era and, and among behaviorists as well. Uh, that thinking is just restrained speaking or acting. So it's uh, so what happens when you think, uh, according to them, is that you suppress the actual execution of an action. So that's the reactivation, uh, or not really a reactivation in that sense. Uh, but it, uh, it says, the, or the consequence of this is that uh, it predicts that one should find reinstatements of the same mechanisms used for direct interaction with the world in various cognitive phenomena. So I'm going to show this in one particular cognitive phenomena. This has been found in, in memory, language, uh, concept formation, and, and various uh, areas. The same kind of results, basically. But they are the strongest in the case of motor imagery. Uh, uh, motor imagery, in case you don't know it, that's the uh, process where you, from a first-person perspective, generate the visual image of executing an action. So this is what ath athletes do a lot. They imagine actually going down uh, the slope or jumping over uh, the, yeah, whatever it's called, the, the high jump. Uh, so they mentally feel themselves doing these things. So it actually feels like they are doing it. Um, and what you can find there when you do uh, imaging studies of that is that uh, brain areas, uh, or similar brain areas as when you actually execute an action gets activated. Um, there are lots of studies on this. Uh, you have the same behavioral effects as well. So it seems like the mental um, uh, or the motor imagery uh, mimics the time it takes to uh, execute an action. So you uh, can find studies where you can actually uh, so for example it takes longer to imagine an, an impossible action like twisting your uh, wrist in ways you can't actually do. Um, uh, then, uh, but it, uh, um, uh, it's easier to remember the things, or imagine the things that you can actually do. And you can have also studies where you uh, uh, tell people to walk a certain distance and then mentally imagine walking a certain distance and you find the same, um, or you find very nice correlations between these. 
uh, between the mental and the actual execution. Uh, another thing, uh, another such aspect is what I try to illustrate with this ugly, very ugly figure. Uh, so it, and that's the principle of, uh, principle of isochrony. That's an, uh, 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 a thing that, uh, uh, or a property of our motor system. So when I draw uh, this uh, eight, it seems like the uh, motor system wants to keep things constant. So the time it takes uh, to draw a circle here is not dependent on the length of the uh, line. So it's actually that when I draw this and I come here, my motor system will automatically speed up. So it takes the same amount of time to draw this as it takes to draw this. And this is a general property that's found in, in other tasks as well. And what I think is nice about this, and others have thought the same, is that this is not something that is generally known. You, I didn't know that my motor system worked like this. So you can't have the uh, subjects influenced by their knowledge of how long it's supposed